Welcome to the journal. On today's show, you're going to learn about an obscure hobby, how is it to come and live in a new city, and about a person who helped newcomers to adjust. We're also going to get a look at Toronto's harbor front and get inside the business of a German grocery store. And we're going to end with a live performance from a special guest. This is the journal. Absolutely nothing. Hello, excuse me, sir. Do you know what the journal is? What do you guys want to say? You're on live television. Welcome to the journal, live from St. Daniel. We're going to kill it today. This is The Journal, live from Centennial College Story Arts Center, produced and hosted by beloved broadcasting students. I'm Lorene Santizu. And I'm Jeremy Prasad. Starting today's show, we're going to learn all about the art of painting and drawing on shoes, properly known as shoe patina. Not only that, we'll be hearing about it from a local stuntman as well as get a, take, get a look in a very good nice shoes. Hi, my name is Steve Shack Shackleton. Uh, in my real life, I am actually a Hollywood stuntman and stunt rigging coordinator. And uh, my passion is actually well, painting and polishing shoes, uh, otherwise known as shoe patina. And in the next few minutes, I'm hopefully going to give you a good demonstration of that. The art of, of shoe patina generally came from France and although it's not it's super popular here in North America in some European countries it's extremely popular years ago I've, I've always sort of liked fashion uh, I, 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 not that I necessarily paid attention to uh, the shows in Paris or what was coming up in, in, the, in the latest Vogue but, but I've always had an affinity for things to look a little different. So for me, it was quite honestly as simple as, you know, I love shoes, but at the time, something like this was about, I should say like this, would be about as crazy as you could get with colors. Um, and I'd seen other kind of crazy stuff uh, in magazines, online, but you couldn't, per you couldn't readily purchase it here. There were no patina artists here in Canada or North America. And so I just started investigating and through trial and error, making my own uh, shoe patinas. As for what colors I like dyeing, a lot of it starts with what the shoe is at the beginning of its life. Obviously I have some personal favorites. I mean, some of my, as you can tell, some of my favorite colors are, are greens and blues. And like I said, purple, very very bright and vibrant purples uh, again not for everybody you know as as, as for what I, I i get out of it i'm, I'm a full-blooded capitalist and i know this might sound strange but strange but i really don't do it uh i, I would love to make a living at it uh, but really i i how did one other, I met another patina artist one day, uh, a, a French gentleman who lives in Toronto now, and we were chatting one day, and uh, he said for him, painting shoes is, is like his yoga. And uh, I guess that when I thought about it, that, that really rings true for me in that it really, I find it to be a very, very relaxing uh, time for myself. Uh, and, and, and very, very satisfying uh, to work on shoes. Uh, sometimes I'll work on a shoe for a couple hours. Sometimes I'll work on a shoe for 
oh, I could work on a shoe for 40 hours if I wanted to. People who aren't necessarily into footwear and fashion, when they'll come up to me at work or at a restaurant or when I'm walking down the street and just say you know, something along the lines of, oh my God, those shoes are so cool, or I've never seen anything like that, and they have a smile on their face, or when I make a pair for someone. For most, most of the time, they actually kind of lose their minds a bit and, and are very happy about it. So again, I know it sounds cliche and corny, uh, but that makes me happy. Can I interview your dog for uh, live television? Hey, what's her name? Luna. Luna, Luna. What do you want to say, Luna? <laughs> She's very excited about the journal. Well, I'll admit, seeing all those beautiful pairs of shoes made me also want to get one myself. Do you think I could pull off the look, Lorraine? Well, if you want to try it yourself, you better use an old and unused pair of shoes. I cannot do it because I forgot all my old pairs in Brazil. Aw, well, if you're feeling a little homesick, Lorraine, then this next doc will most likely be able to help you too. Because this next doc is going to talk about the experiences from a person that also came from Brazil, and just like you. Training training was unusual to everyone. For me, it was my first year of adulthood, the coming of age I have always expected. Instead, I found myself isolated from everyone and everything I knew. The story starts in Brazil, with me, my family, and my dog. Of course, I decided that a little small town was not enough for me, so I did what I always dreamed of, went to a big city. And, of course, I was an ant in the jungle. I was scared little girl, completely by myself among millions of unknown faces. I still kinda am. And those are the times when I am reminded of what I left back home. Oh. Oi. Oi, Ana. Whenever it got too much, my biggest escape was my family. I I would be able to like play games with them. We would build puzzles. We would cook something. Sabe quanto tempo faz que eu não como brigadeiro? Aí no Canadá não tem brigadeiro não? Não. É brasileiro brigadeiro? Brigadeiro is a traditional Brazilian sweet. They are basically just chocolate balls. All you have to do is mix butter, chocolate powder, and sweet that condensed milk. And there you go. You just turn it into a ball and you add sprinkles. Please add sprinkles. It's the most important part. It's kind of funny because like when we live it together, each person had their own personal way of doing brigadeiro and we all would disagree with it. And now I'm just like, I wish I could eat some of my sister's brigadeiro. Oh, o meu computador tá piscando aqui a bateria. Tchau. Tchau, Ana. Tchau, tchau. Tchau. Fui. There's this silence when you finish a call and you're just staring at a black screen and the world around you feels empty. It's like I already pissed them. But I wouldn't change this experience for anything. Feeling lonely in a big new city, it's, it's really scary. But at the same time, it's amazing because you're in a big new city. Nothing makes me happier than exploring my new city while also being able to share with those back home. Where should they talk? Also, I can always carry a piece of my hometown with me and share it with the new people I'm meeting at the new places I'm encountering. Now, what would you like to say to the people back at home? <laughs> hi. You want to say hi? Is there anything else you want to tell them? No. Did Chris Rock deserve it? Yeah. He did. Okay, let's go. Oh, it's always good to think about home. Yeah. And you know what? What? 
Anna's brigadeiro is delicious. Oh, Lee, I need to try some myself. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. nice to have a friend from home on your way, right? Yeah. Uh, so, what's next? Well, coming up next, your doc's coming up next, actually. Oh yeah, it's about my host mama and how she opened her home to students from all across the world. Hello, welcome. Welcome to Canada and your new home in Canada. This is our homestay, come in. So my name is Luella Pereira and I migrated to Canada from India in the year 1996. I've been here since then and I started doing homestay in the year 2002. It started because I thought it would supplement my income, but then it turned out to be something really beautiful because it not only supplemented my income, it gave me good company, it made me study different cuisines, cultures, people, and it broadened my horizons. I have now extended families all over the world because homestay was just not a business, but it became my life. A host mom is somebody who makes a student feel at home, which is a home away from home because all these international students travel very far across the seven seas to come and make Canada their new home to study. It's a great experience. I've got to learn more about other countries, cultures, and most of all cuisine because I love to cook. So I made it a point to visit the students in their home countries and see and experience firsthand how they live, what they eat, and what kind of things they like. So when they come to me, I can offer those things to them so that it makes them feel at home. Uh, some of the students, when they came, they brought a piece of their country to me and said, this is what we want you to see. This is our country. So this is from Berlin. A boy came from Berlin, another boy from Sweden. Then there was a boy from Germany. Then this is my Japanese students who brought these, the sushi, this one. But mostly the magnets here are given to me by students, giving me a piece of their country. Or some when I travel, because I travel a lot, I bring a souvenir from each country. So that's how I collected all these. And they are piece of people who are in my heart. I don't know whether I told you the story of these Swiss boys. Rene was, Remo was booked with me and his friend was booked down the road. Mm -hmm. And in five minutes after he came, Remo, uh, Dominic came walking back and he said, can I come in? I said, yes. And he came and he looked at my place and he told me, I'm not going back, I'm staying here. But I said, you're not booked here. He said, but I'm staying here. How much money do you want? I said, no, I don't want money. You're not booked here, I don't have space. He said, I will stay in the room with Remo. And uh, the school, I called the school, they said, please, Luella, he doesn't want to go anywhere. His home stays terrible, he wants to stay with you. So I said, okay, on Monday he can go to another home. But he said, I'll pay whatever she wants, I'm staying right here. For that one month, I had both these two and this Korean boy. I had to cook a lot of food, but it was a lot of fun. And when I went to Switzerland, he gave me the time of my life. He yodeled all along the mountains and took me everywhere. It was a fun-filled day. So that's Dominic. He says he'll never forget me. Family for me is all the people who live together, care about each other, go through everything, you know, the sad times, the good times, and enjoy each other and stand for each other. Even though my students have gone back and they are having a hard time, they still call me and I talk to them, I comfort them. So it's not like when they go, they're gone, they're still a part of my life. Come to the journal, okay? You ready? Three, two, one. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the journal. journal! Yeah, okay. There we go, perfect. 30 seconds. Oh, it was nice seeing her again. Now that I'm in Toronto, it would be nice to know more about the city. And I bet some more international students want to know more about it too. Well, that's quite convenient. 
because next we're going to take a trip down to Toronto's harbor front and get a look at uh, a live look at England as well as uh, the Centennial College and Portsmouth students link up and talk about local history going on at the harbor front. Want to know something new? <laughs> Hello, I'm Alessio Zalezi, and today we're going to be going on a nice wintry walk by the harbor front. We're going to learn a bit about the history of this location and how it has developed over the years. So uh, let's, uh, let's get going. Hello, my name's Michelle. I'm going to be taking you on a walk through Portsmouth. Right now we're approaching the ferry, which is the place to go if you want to go to the Centre Island. A lovely destination during the year. Now originally the ferry was just the Toronto Harbour Ferry or Centre Island Ferry, something like that. But it was recently renamed to the Jack Layton Ferry in honour of the former NDP leader. He was a very popular local Toronto politician. Let's get going. We are now approaching the Guild Hall. It was built in 1890 and was known as the Portsmouth Town Hall up until 1926. It has five bells in the bell tower and collectively have the name Pompey Chimes, which goes off every 15 minutes. When Toronto was founded, what we're standing on right now was a whole lot of water. You see, in the early days, the Toronto Harbour Front was just your standard little dock. Now, after uh, World War I, there was mass land reclamation programs, so we pushed the waterfront about a kilometer forwards. This was also coinciding when Toronto was really becoming a boom town. So this area was a lot of industrial areas, you know, factories, shipping, manufacturing, all of it. It was a big, big part of the Toronto economy at the time. But then in the 50s, as the city began to expand outwards, there was a push to redevelop the land, reorganize it. As industry slowly moved to the suburbs, this whole area started to become more residential, more corporate businesses. The final completion of that would have been in the 80s, when most of the industries were gone. Even today we still have a few legacy ones, but those are kind of tourist locations in addition to any manufacturing they do. Most of the buildings you'll see along the harbor front didn't exist even like 10, 20 years ago, right? The past couple of decades, I've saw a lot of construction and there has been no real slowdown over there even. That's just gonna be a big building anytime soon, you know? Now we are walking to Victoria Park. It was officially opened in 1878 and was the first public park to open in Portsmouth. It is a lovely place and beautiful to walk through. In the park there is an animal area which ranges depending on the season. Currently there are a range of birds like chickens and roosters. In the middle of the park there is a replica of a Chinese bell in a miniature pagoda raised by the crew of HMS Orlando in honour of their fallen shipmates lost during the campaign to relieve Peking in the 1900s. Now we're going to be approaching the uh, Beaver Tales tourist destination. I'm sure it has a fancier name but that's what it is. It's a Beaver Tales and it's a tourist destination. You can get uh, famously Canadian delicious sweet treats. Any place along the waterfront uh, offers good access to the downtown core. So like you can make it your way down to the waterfront, get a beautiful look at the lake. Maybe not this time of year, but you know, there's something nice about the winter winds. Waterfront's sort of a mix of uh, residential, business, corporate area. Uh, further to my right, you can see the RBC building. There are many condominiums, restaurants. Portsmouth Historic Dockyard is the UK's premier destination for naval history. 
Leading up to the historical Dockyard Museum, you are able to see life-size chains and anchors, which gives you a sneak peek into what held within. Now we'll soon be arriving at our destination, the Harbour Front Centre. Harbour Front Centre has been a mainstay of the Harbour Front for quite a while. It used to be an old power plant that they re repurposed for community needs. What I like about the waterfront is, well, the water. You go to the waterfront to see the water. We have now reached the seafront. Thank you for joining us on our walk and I hope you enjoyed. Now we get to just appreciate it. Look at the city, appreciate the sky, the wind, the fresh air. Ain't it nice? Oh. Ready? Oh, sorry. Okay. Three, two, Oprah one, go. Welcome the to the journal. Thank you. Have a good one. Yo, learning about the harbor front down at Portsmouth and Toronto was excellent. But now after seeing Alessio at Beaver Tales, like I'm so damn hungry. Is there any donuts in here? What? There's no donuts left? Like, are you crazy? Yo, I'm going to go get some food. You know, I'm so hungry. I'll be right back. Lorraine, sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay. I'm so sorry, guys, but I'm going to make you even hungrier because we're going to take a look at the behind the scenes at the Vienna Fine Foods, a local ethnic German grocery. So my name is Ken Brandis and uh, my family is the owner of Vienna Fine Foods. I kind of do everything. Um, I, I focus on the meat department. I cut a lot of meat. I prep it for the counter. Um, I do a lot of cooking, um, prepared foods. I also manage the store. So oh, trouble. We have six, six stuffed chicken breasts for 11 o'clock this morning. It's okay, we have seven in the freezer. Oh, okay. So, so the, the biggest, I guess, um, uniqueness to the store is the fact that it's, it is a specialty store. It's... Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Fine Foods. Thank you. How is everybody this morning? It still is sort of a, an ethnic store. Um, hence the name Vienna Fine Foods. It's you know German, Austrian, Swiss. At least it, when it started, it catered to that. If you you know look at the shelves, the groceries that we buy, that's all. All that stuff is imported. It all comes from Europe. You know, predominantly German, but you know it also other other places. It's what brings the people in, right? Like the different jams, the coffees, the noodles, the spätzle, the the soups, those kinds of things. It's it's a place where you can only really get it. Here, or there's other places, but there's not nearly as many places as there used to be. The best thing that we ever did for the store was the lunch counter, our mm -hmm. little imbus. Really allowed us to, to really develop that sort of that ethnic specialty store where, you know, things that you can't get elsewhere, you get here. No one sells sauerkraut, no one sells red cabbage, no one sells rouladen or goulash. No one sells that stuff. You know, labor case, the, the specialties. That's why, you know, I think we stuck around for a bit, but but just that lunch counter really it expanded everything, right? And and having the right product, having the right people working there, right? The service is obviously key. Um, just having the selection, everything, you know, being able to cook to order, that's helped. We're not, we're not trying to get rich here, right? It's just about, it's about providing a good experience for our customers. It's about keeping the culture alive. Um, it's just about, you know, letting the people that work here make a good living. Um, and, and just, just sort of trying to, trying to, trying to just turn the store around in a different direction that, you know, that we become more of a family store, a place where people who live in the neighborhood shop, 
you know, it'll always be an ethnic store. It'll always be a place to buy that German stuff or that Austrian stuff. It'll always be a place to get those, you know, your Christmas specialties and your Easter specialties. But, you know, just the goal of the store is always not just to survive but to thrive. But, you know, people people come here, but, you know, word of mouth and, and, you know, usually the hard part is getting someone into the store for the first time. Once they come in, generally speaking, we'll see them again. I'm Ken Brandis and uh, this is Vienna Fine Foods. And this guy over here, I like him, he's got a sick haircut. Can you say welcome to the journal? Sorry? Welcome, welcome to the journal with me. One, two, three. Welcome to the journal. There we go, look at that. Gesundheit. Ethnic grocery stores and shops. No matter where you're from or in the world, you can always find somewhere to make you feel at home. But now that we've seen all of our documentaries, it is now time for a special live performance from our talented host, Lorraine. Yeah, we should have gotten an actual performer. Thanks, Jeremy. I hope you like Guns N' Roses. Wait a minute. Sorry about that. <laughs> Honestly, Lorini, like that was so amazing. Like you have no idea. I never knew you were that talented and it, it. honestly, like it touched my soul. Stop and it. you should just keep doing your music, follow your dreams, because you sound amazing. Thanks, Jeremy. No problem. Oh, well, unfortunately, it's time for us to wrap things up. So I'm Lorene Sanchez. And I'm Jeremy Prasad. And welcome for watching The, the Journal. Journal. See you next time.